All righty then. Greetings and good evening. Welcome once again. All praise be to the Most High um, for another opportunity to come and share this very important history. My name is Amuni Israel. This is the Lev Project. Um, we're currently in the book of Incidents in the Life of a Slaver Girl. If you haven't heard the, what's, what was it like, portion number four, um, we're on chapter six and seven. So if you have no idea, go ahead and jump back to the beginning um, so that you can get caught up. But for the long and short of it, it is about a young woman who's giving her experience. This is in the 1800 of her experience in slavery in the South. And currently she's talking about, currently she's talking about her experience as a young woman who um, was being preyed on by her master, uh, Mr. What's his name again? I forgot his name, his name, oh, Flint, <laughs> Mr. Flint. Um, and so we're going to start off at chapter six. I'm going to give everybody just a, a little bit of second to join us. Oh, we had, oh, y'all joined us already. That's what's up. So, <laughs> you know me, I like to kind of start on time. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. And if you want to read or if you have any questions or comments, just feel free to share it. And if I see it before I finish, then I definitely will share. So the jealous mistress is the name of this chapter, chapter six. One second. All right. I would 10,000 times rather that my children should be half starved paupers of Ireland than to be the most pampered among the slaves of America. Let me read that again. Start off at the beginning. I would 10,000 times rather that my children should be half starved paupers of Ireland than to be the most pampered among the slaves of America. I would rather drudge out my life on a cotton plantation till the grave opened to get me rest than to live with an unprincipled master and a jealous mistress. The felon's home in a penitentiary is preferable. He may repent and turn from the errors of his ways and so find peace, but it is not so with a favorite slave. She's not allowed to have any pride of character. It is deemed a crime in her to wish to be virtuous. Mrs. Frank possessed the key to her husband's character before I was born. She might have used his this knowledge to counsel and screen the young and the innocent among her slaves, but for them, she had no sympathy. They were the objects of her constant suspicion and malevolence. She watched her husband with unceasing vigilance, but he was well practiced in means to evade it. What he could not find opportunity to say in words, he manifested in signs. He invented more than were ever thought of in a deaf and dumb asylum. I let them pass as if I did not understand what he meant. And many were the curses and threats bestowed on me for my stupidity. One day, he caught me teaching myself to write. He frowned as if he was not well pleased, but I suppose he came to the conclusion that such an accomplishment might help to advance his favorite scheme. Before long, notes were often slipped into my hand. I, could, I would return them saying, I can't read them, sir. Can you, he replied. Can't you, he replied. Then I must read them to you. He always finished the reading by asking, do you understand? Sometimes he would complain of the heat of the tea room and order his supper to be placed on a small table in the piazza. He would seat himself there with a well-satisfied smile and tell me to stand by the brush to brush away the flies. He would eat very slowly, pausing between the mouthfuls. These intervals were employed in describing the happiness I was so foolishly throwing away and in threatening me with the penalty that finally awaited my stubborn disobedience. Sorry, the babies are talking on level 10. <laughs> oh, I missed my spot here. He boasted much of the forbearance he had exercised towards me and reminded me that there was a limit to his patience. When I succeeded in avoiding opportunities for him to talk to me at home, I was ordered to come to his office to do some errand. When there, I, I was obliged to stand and listen to such language as he saw fit to address me, 
Sometimes I so openly express my contempt for him that he would become violent and enraged. I wondered why he did not strike me. Circumstance as he was, he probably thought it was better policy to be forbearing. But the state of things grew worse and worse daily. In desperation, I told him that I must and would apply to my grandmother for protection. He threatened me with death and worse than death if I had made any complaint to her. Strange to say, I did not despair. I was naturally a buoyant this I was naturally of a buoyant disposition, and always I had a hope of something somehow getting out of his clutches. Like many a poor, simple slave before me, I trusted that some threads of joy would it yet be in, woven into my dark destiny. Like this dude was thirsty. <laughs> okay, Mr. Flint was thirsty, like he didn't have somebody. He okay, but let me not just put in my two cents. Let's keep going. I had entered my 16th year and every day it became more and more apparent that my presence was intolerable to Mrs. Flint. Angry words frequently passed between her and her husband. He had never punished me himself and he would not allow anybody else to punish me. In that respect, she was never satisfied. But in her angry moods, no terms were too vile for her to bestow upon me. Yet I, whom she detested so bitterly, had far more pity for her than he did, whose duty it was to make her life happy. I never wronged her or wished to wrong her, and one word of kindness from her would have brought me to her feet. After repeated quarrels between the doctor and his wife, he announced his intention to take his youngest daughter, then four years old, to sleep in his apartment. It was necessary that a servant should sleep in the same room to be on hand if the child stirred. I was selected for the office and informed for what purpose that arrangement had been made. By managing to keep within sight of the people as much as possible during the day, I had hitherto succeeded in ex eluding my master, though a razor was often held to my throat to force me to change this line of policy. Do so, I'm getting violent. At night, I slept by the side of my great aunt where I felt slave, saved. He was too prudent to come into her room. She was an old woman and had been in the family many years. Moreover, as a married man and a professional man, he deemed it necessary to save appearances in some degree. But he resolved to remove the obstacle in the way of his scheme, and he thought he had planned it so that he should evade suspicion. He was well aware how much I prized my refuge by the side of my old aunt, and he determined to dispossess me of it. The first night, the doctor had the little child in his room alone. The next morning, I was ordered to take my station as the nurse the following night. A kind providence interposed in my favor. During the day, Mrs. Flint heard of this new assignment and a storm followed. I rejoiced to hear it rage. After a while, my mistress sent for me to come to her room. Her first question was, did you know you were to sleep in the doctor's room? Yes, ma'am. Who told you? My master. Will you answer truly all the questions I ask? Yes, ma'am. Tell me then, as you hope to be forgiven, are you innocent of what I have accused you? I am. She handed me a Bible and said, lay your hand on your heart, kiss this holy book, and swear before God that you tell me the truth. I took the oath she required, and I did it with a clear conscience. You have taken God's holy word to testify your innocence, said she. If you have deceived me, beware. Now take this stool, sit down, look me directly in my face and tell me all that has passed between your master and you. I did as she ordered. As I went on with my account, her color changed frequently. She wept and sometimes groaned. She spoke in tones so sad that I was touched by her grief. The tears came to my eyes, but I was soon convinced that her emotions arose from anger and wounded pride. She felt that her marriage vows were desecrated and her dignity insulted, but she had no compassion for the, for the poor victim of her husband's perfidy. She pitied herself as a martyr, but she was incapable of feeling for the condition of shame and misery in which her unfortunate helpless slave was placed. Yet perhaps she had some touch of feelings for me, for when the, confer the conference was ended, she spoke kindly and promised to protect me. 
I should have been much comforted by this assurance if I could have had confidence in it. But my experience in slavery have filled me with distrust. She was not a very refined woman and had not much control over her passions. I was an object of her jealousy and consequently of her hatred. And I knew I could not expect kindness or confidence from her under the circumstance in which I was placed. I could not blame her. Slaveholders' wives feel as other women would under similar circumstances. The fire of her content kindled from small sparks, and now the flame became so intense that the doctor was obliged to give up his intended arrangement. Give me one second, I'll be right back with you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience. I had to go to Babyville for a minute, and now I'm back. All right. I knew I had ignited the torch, and I expected to suffer for it afterwards. But I felt too much thankful to my mistress for the timely aid she rendered me to care about that. She now took me to sleep in a room adjoined her own. There I was an object of her especial care, though not of her especial comfort, for she spent many a sleepless night to watch over me. Sometimes I woke up and found her bending over me. Stalker, sorry. At other times she whispered in my ear as though it was her husband. Like she's deluded, like no one really wanted the old crusty doctor European dude. But anywho, jealousy is something. Um, sometimes I woke up and found her bend over me. At other times she whispered in my ear as though it was her husband who was speaking to me and listened to hear what I would answer. If she startled me on such occasion, she would glide stealthily away. And the next morning she would tell me I had been talking in my sleep and ask who I was talking to. At last I began to be fearful for my life. It had been often threatened. And you can imagine better than I can describe what an unpleasant sensation it must produce to wake up in the dead of the night and find a jealous woman bending over you. Terrible as this experience was, I had fears that it would give place to one more terrible. My mistress grew weary of her vigils they did not prove satisfactory. She changed her tactics. She now tried the trick of accusing my master of crime in my presence and gave my name as the author of the accusations. To my utter astonishment, he replied, I don't believe it, but if she did acknowledge it, you tortured her into exposing me. Tortured into exposing him? Truly, Satan had no difficulty in distinguishing the color of his soul. I understand his object in making this false act representation. It was to show me that I gained nothing by seeking the protection of my mistress, that the power was still all in his own hands. I pity Mrs. Flint. She was a second wife, many years the junior of her husband, and the hoary-headed miscreant. She called him a hoary-headed miscreant. <laughs> I'm sorry. And where am I? Uh, and the hoary-headed miscreant was enough to try the patience of a wiser and better woman. She was completely foiled and knew not how to proceed. She would gladly have had me flogged for my supposed false oath. But as I have already stated, the doctor never allowed anyone to whip me. The old sinner was politic. Yeah, politic. The application of the lash might have led to remarks that would have exposed him in the eyes of his children and grandchildren. How often did I rejoice that I lived in a town where all the inhabitants knew each other? If I had been on a remote plantation or lost among the multitude of a crowded city, I should not be a living woman at this day. The secrets of slavery are concealed like those of the Inquisition. That's interesting. My master was, to my knowledge, the father of 11 slaves. But did the mothers dare to tell who was the father of their children? Did the other slaves dare to allude to it? Except in whispers among themselves. No, indeed, they knew too well the terrible consequences. My grandmother could not avoid seeing things which excited her suspicion. She was uneasy about me and tried various ways to build by me, but the never changing answer was always repeated. Linda does not belong to me. She's my master, she's my daughter's property, and I have no legal right to sell her. 
the con conscientious man, he was too scrupulous to sell me. But he had no scruples whatsoever about committing a much greater wrong against the helpless young girl placed under his guardianship as his daughter's property. Sometimes my persecutor would ask me whether I would like to be sold. I told him I would rather be sold to anybody than to lead such a life as I did. On such occasions, he would assume the air of a very injured individual and reproach me for my ingratitude. Did I take you into the house and make you the companion of my own children, he would say? Have I ever treated you like a Negro? I've never allowed you to be punished, not even to please your mistress. And this is the recompense I get, you ungrateful girl. I answered that he had reasons of his own for screening me from punishment and that the course he pursued made my mistress hate me and persecute me. If I wept, he would say, poor child, don't cry, don't cry. I will make peace for you and your mistress. Only let me arrange matters in my own way. Poor foolish girl. You don't know what it is for your own good. I would cherish you. I would make a lady of you. Now go and think of all that I have promised. I did think of it. Reader, I draw no imaginary pictures of Southern homes. I am telling you the plain truth. Yet, when victims make their escape from the wild beasts of slavery, Northerners consent to the act of the bloodhounds and hunt the poor fugitives back into this den, full of dead body, sorry, full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Nay, more, they are not only willing, but proud to give their daughters in marriages to slaveholders. The poor girls have romantic notions of sunny climb and flowering vines that all the year round shade a happy home. To what disappointment are they destined? The young wife soon learns the husband in whose hands she has been placed. So she has placed her happiness, pays no regard to his marriage vows. Children of every shade of complexion play with her own fair babies and too well she knows that they are born unto him of his own household. Jealousy and hatred enter the flowery home and is ravaged of its loveliness. Southern women often marry a man knowing that he is the father of many little slaves. They do not trouble themselves about it. They regard such children as property, as marketable as the pigs on the plantation. And it is seldom that they do not make them aware of this by passing them into the slave trader's hands as soon as possible, and thus then getting them out of their sight. I'm glad to say there are some honorable exceptions. I have myself known two Southern wives who exhorted their husbands to free those slaves towards whom they stood in a paternal relation, quote unquote, and their request was granted. These husbands blush before the superior nobleness of their wives' nature, though they only con consult counsel them to do what to do that which it was their duty to do. It commanded their respect and rendered their conduct very Oh, sorry, conduct more exemplary. Concealment was at the end and confidence took the place of distrust. Though this bad institution deadens the moral sense, even in white women, it is a fearful extent. It is not altogether extinct. I have heard Southern ladies say of Mr. Such at one, he's not, he not only thinks, sorry. I've heard Southern ladies say of Mr. Such a one, he not only thinks it not disgrace to be the father of these little niggers, quote unquote, but he is not ashamed to call himself their master. I declare such things ought not to be tolerated in an, any decent society. That's the ending of chapter six. And she's telling about that wild, wild, uh, <laughs> a wild, wild mistress or slave master lady who instead of placing it where it belongs, which is the husband and their relationship, She's taking it out on her. And she says she would rather be a field Negro, basically. And uh, like I said before, a lot of our, our people who speak about slavery try to project that the, the field Negro had it worse than that one in the house. But she's explaining that her house position had her to work tirelessly in the field than to be basically sexually harassed and mentally exploited in the house. So that's crazy. But if anybody has anything to say, feel free to do so. Um, I'm gonna go on to chapter seven the lover why does the slave ever love why allow the tendrils of the heart to twine around objects which may at any moment be wrenched away by the hand of violence when separations come by the hand of death 
the pious soul can bow in resignation and say, not my will, but thy will, O Most High. Well, she said, O Lord. But when the ruthless hand of man strikes the blow, regardless of the misery he causes, it is hard to be submissive. I did not reason thus when I was a young girl. Youth will be youth. I loved and I indulged the hope that the dark clouds around me would turn out a bright light lining. I forgot that in land of my birth, the shadows are too dense for a light to penetrate a land. Where the laughter is not mirth, nor thought the mind, nor words a language, nor amend mankind. She's quoting a poem here. Where cries reply to curses, shrieks to blows, and each is tortured in his separate hell. There was in the neighborhood a young colored carpenter, a free born man. He had been well acquainted in childhood. We had been well acquainted in childhood and frequently met together afterwards. We became mutually attached and he proposed to marry me. I loved him with the adore of a young girl's first love. But when I reflected that I was a slave and that the laws gave no sanction to the marriage of such, my heart sank within me. My lover wanted to buy me, but I knew that Dr. Flint was too willful and arbitrary a man to consent to that arrangement. I was sure of experiencing all sorts of opposition and I had nothing to hope from a mistress. She would have been delighted to have got rid of me, but not in that way. I would have relieved her mind of a burden if she could have seen me sold to some distant state. But if I was married near home, I should be just as much in her husband's power as I had previously been. For the husband of a slave has no power to her protect her. I'll read that again. She says, concerning the mistress, she would have been delighted to have gotten rid of me, but not in that way. It would have relieved her mind of a burden if she could have see, seen me sold to some distant state. But if I was married near home, I should be just as much in her husband's power as I had previously been. For the husband of a slave has no power to protect her. Moreover, my mistress, like many others, seemed to think that slaves had no right to any family ties of their own, that they were created merely to wait upon the family of the mistress. I once heard her abuse a young slave girl who told her that a colored man wanted to make her his wife. I will have you peeled and pickled, my lady, said she, if I ever hear you mention that subject again. Do you suppose that I will have you tending my children with the children of a nigger? The girl to whom she said this had a mulatto child, of course, not acknowledged by its father. The poor black man who loved her would have been proud to acknowledge his helpless offspring. So they didn't want you to have nothing, nothing. Many, many and anxious were the thoughts I revolved in my mind. I was at a loss what to do. Above all things, I was desirous to spare my lover the insults that had cut so deeply into my own soul. I talked with my grandmother about it and partly told her my fears. I did not dare to tell her the worst. She had long suspected all was not right. And if I confirmed her suspicions, I knew a storm would rise that would prove the overthrow of all my hopes. This love dream had been my support through my many trials and I could not bear to run the risk of having it suddenly dissipated. There was a lady in the neighborhood, a particular friend of Dr. Flint's who often visited the house. I had a great respect for her and she always manifested a friendly interest in me. Grandmother thought that she would have a great influence with the doctor. I went to this lady and told her my story. I told her I was aware that my lovers being a free man would prove a great objection, but he wanted to buy me. And if Dr. Flint would consent to the arrangement, I felt sure he would be willing to pay any reasonable price. She knew that Dr. Mrs. Flint disliked me. Therefore, I ventured to suggest that perhaps my mistress would approve of me being sold as that would rid her of me. The lady listened with kindly sympathy and promised to do her utmost to promote my wishes. She had an interview with the doctor and I believe she pleaded my cause earnestly, but it was all to no purpose. How I dreaded my master now. Every minute I expected to be summoned to his presence, but the day passed and I heard nothing from him. The next morning a message was brought to me. Master wants you in his study. 
I found the door ajar and I stood a moment gazing at the hateful man who claimed a right to rule me, body and soul. One moment, please. I hear a, a dinging on this side. Make sure somebody's not sending over a message. It's getting turned up. One second, please. So now the doctor, he, he's calling her. He's calling her to the office now because now it's all a game. It's a game for her. Let's see. It's a game for him um, to, to be able to subjugate her. Uh, we have, okay, I'm going to save the comments. Thank you. Keep sending the comments, and then we're going we're gonna to revisit these comments after we finish. So I have some comments on the other side. That's what we were hearing. So no problem. My name is Imuna Yisrael on Facebook. So if you have any comments that you would like to add, feel free to do so. Let me see here. All right. Or you can do it on the YouTube video. The chat is open. Okay, so she goes to the study. I entered and tried to appear calm. I did not want him to know how much my heart was bleeding. He looked fixedly at me, fixedly at me, and with an expression which seemed to say, I have half a mind to kill you on the spot. At least he broke the silence, and that was a relief to both of us. So, you want to be married, do you? said he. And to a free nigga? Yes, sir. Well, I'll soon convince you whether I'm your master or the nigga fella you honor so highly. If you must have a husband, you may take up one of my slaves. What a situation I should be in. As the wife of one of his slaves, even in my heart, had been interested. Even, no, as the wife of one of his slaves, even if my heart had been interested, I replied, don't you suppose, sir, that a slave can have some preference about marrying? Do you suppose that all men are alike to her? Do you love this nigga? Said he abruptly. That sounds like a conversation out the hood. Do you love that nigga? I mean, this is the same verbiage, but sorry. Yes, sir. How dare you tell me so, he exclaimed in great wrath. After a slight pause, he added, I suppose you thought more of yourself than you felt above the insults of such puppies. I replied, if he's a puppy, I am a puppy, for we are both of the Negro race. It is a right, no, it is right and honorable for us to love each other. The man you call a puppy never insulted me, and he would not love me if he did not believe me to be a virtuous woman. You know, he's getting boiled up right now. He sprang upon me like a tiger and gave me a stunning blow. It was the first time he had ever struck me and fear did not enable me to control my anger. When I had recovered a little from the effects, I explained, you have struck me for answering you honestly, how I despise you. There was silence for some minutes. Perhaps he was deciding what should be my punishment, or perhaps he wanted to give me time to reflect on what I had said and to whom I had said it. Finally, he asked, do you know what you have said? Yes, sir, but your treatment drove me to it. Do you know that I have the right to do as I like with you, that I can kill you if I please? You have tried to kill me and I wish you had, but you have no right to do as you like with me. Silence, he exclaimed in a thundering voice. By heavens, girl, you forgot, you, you forgot yourself too far. Are you mad? If you are, I will soon bring you to your senses. Do you think any other master would bear what I have borne for you this morning? Many masters would have killed you on the spot. How would you like to be sent to jail for your insolence? That's the word they like to use, insolence. I know I have been disrespectful, sir, I replied, but you drove me to it. I couldn't help it. As for jail, there will be more peace for me there than here. You deserve to go there, said he, and to be under such treatment that you will forget the meaning of the word peace. It would do you good. It would take some of your high notions out of you. But I'm not ready to send you there yet, notwithstanding your ingratitude for all my kindness and forbearance. You have been the plague of my life. I've wanted to make you happy. I've been, <laughs> I can't, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this dude is bugging out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is real talk right here. This is, this dude is bugging out, I'm sorry. I have wanted to make you happy. I can't even read this stuff with a straight face. I have been repaid with the basis in gratitude, but though you have proved yourself incapable of appreciating my kindness, I will be lenient towards you, Linda. 
I will give you one more chance to redeem your character, redeem your character. If you behave yourself and do as I require, I will forgive you and treat you as I have always done. But if you disobey me, I will punish you as I would the meanest slave on my plantation. Never let me hear that fellow's name mentioned again. If I ever know of you speaking to him, I will co-hide you both. Okay, the dude is free. Okay, you can't go out. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, co-hide you both. And if I catch him lurking around my premises, I will shoot him as soon as I would a dog. Do you hear what I say? I teach you a lesson about marriage and free niggas. Now go and let this be the last time I have occasion to speak to you on the subject. Reader, did you ever hate? I hope not. I never did but once, and I trust I never shall again. Somebody has called it the atmosphere of hell, and I believe it so. For a fortnight, the doctor did not speak to me. He thought to mortify me, to make me feel that I had disgraced myself by receiving the honorable addresses of a respectable colored man in preference to his base proposals of a white man. But though his lips disdained to address me, his eyes were very loquacious. No animal ever watches prey more narrowly than he watched me. He knew that I could write, though he had failed to make me read his letters, and he was now troubled lest I should exchange letters with another man. After a while, he became weary of silence, and I was sorry for it. One morning, as he passed through the hall to leave the house, he contrived to thrust a note into my hand. I thought I had read it, and spare myself the vexation of having him read it to me. It expressed regret for the blow he had given me and reminded me that I myself was wholly to blame for it. He hoped I had become convinced of the injury I was doing myself incurring his displeasure. He wrote that he had made up his mind to go to Louisiana, that he should take several slaves with him and intended I should be one of his number. My mistress would remain where she is, was, therefore I should have nothing to fear for the qua for the for that quarter if i merited kindness from him he assured me that it would be lavishly bestowed he begged me to think over the matter and answer the following day the next morning i was called to carry a pair of scissors to his room like you couldn't get your own scissors i laid them on the table with the letter beside him then he thought it was my answer and did not call me back I went as usual to attend my young mistress to and from school. He met me in the street and ordered me to stop at his office on my way back. When I entered, he showed me his letter and asked me why I had not answered it. I replied, I am your daughter's property and it is in your power to send me wherever you please. He said he was glad to find me so willing to go and that we should start early in the autumn. He had a large practice in the town and I rather thought he had made up the story merely to frighten me. However that might be, I was determined that I would never go to Louisiana with him. Summer passed away and early in the autumn, Dr. Flint's eldest son was sent to Louisiana to examine the country with a view to immigrate, immigrating. The news did not disturb me. I knew very well that I should not be sent with him, that I had not been taken to the plantation before this time was owing to the fact that his son was there. He was jealous of his son and jealousy of the overseer had kept him from punishing me by sending me into the fields to work. It is strange that I was not proud of these protectors. No, sorry. Is it strange? He asked the question. Is it strange that I was not proud of these protectors? As for the overseer, he was a man from whom I had less respect than I would for a bloodhound. Young Mr. Flint did not bring back a favorable report of Louisiana and I heard no more of the scheme. Soon after this, my lover met me at the corner of the street and I stopped to speak to him. Looking up, I saw my master watching us from his window. I hurried home, trembling with fear. I was sent for immediately to go to his room. He met me with a blow. In Boxar again, but yeah, said to me, sorry. When is mistress to be married, said he, in a snickering tone. A shower of oaths and imprecations followed. How thankful I was that my lover was a free man, that my tyrant had no power to flog him for speaking to me in the street. Again and again, I revolved in my mind how all this would end. There was no hope that the doctor would consent to sell me on any terms. 
He had an iron will and was determined to keep me and to conquer me. My lover was an intelligent and religious man. Even if he could have obtained permission to marry me while I was a slave, the marriage would give him no power to protect me from my master. It would have made him miserable to witness the insults I should have been subjected to. And then, if we had children, I knew the, they must follow, quote, the condition of the mother, end quote. What a terrible blight that would be on the heart of a free, intelligent father. For his sake, I felt that I ought not to link his fate with my own unhappy destiny. He was going to Savannah to see about a little property left him by an uncle. And hard as it was to bring my feelings to it, I earnestly entreated him not to come back. I advised him to go to the free states where his tongue would not be tied and where his intelligence would be of more avail to him. He left me still hoping the day would come when I could be bought. With, the, with me, the lamp of hope had gone out. The dream of my girlhood was over. I felt lonely and desolate. Still, I was not stripped of all. I still had my good grandmother and my affectionate brother. When he put his arms around my neck and looked into my eyes, as if to read there the troubles I dared not tell, I felt that I still had something to love, something to love. But even that pleasant emotion was chilled by the reflection that he might be torn from me at any moment by some sudden fear, freak of my master. If he had known how we loved each other, I think he would have exulted in separating us. We often planned together how we could get to the north, but as William remarked, such things are easier said than done. My movements were very closely watched and we had no means of getting any money to defray our expenses. As, for, as my grandmother, she was strongly opposed to her children undertaking any such project. She had not forgotten poor Benjamin's suffering and she was afraid that if another child tried to escape, we, or sorry, not we, he would have a similar or worse fate. To me, nothing seemed most dreadful than my present life. I said to myself, William must be free. He shall go to the North and I will follow him. Many a, many a slave sister has formed the same plans. Well, we got a short chapter here coming up, but let me read some of the comments. What time is it? 9.24. We got a one page chapter here on chapter eight. So I'm gonna bust that chapter eight out as well. Um, but let me go ahead and read some of the comments we have thus far. We have Ema saying that, I think that's why the white women of today still have that DNA hatred of the African and woman counterparts. I agree, I came to that conclusion as well, Ema, after I read this book, that there was some inbred jealousy going on there. 11 children by the slaves was a nasty dog. <laughs> She says, shake my head. Yeah, they, you know, it's all, like I said, it's all a game for him. He And, and there was a law. I think I'm going to do a little introductory uh, slavery 101. So because but that quote that she made, that the, the condition of the child follows the mother, when I began to research, I found out that that law came around like 1655. It was earlier on in slavery. If anybody wants to look it up, it was a woman by the name of Alicia, no, Elizabeth Key. And what happened was she was the descendant of a European and a, and a, and a, and a quote unquote, I don't know if it was a slave, yeah, it was a slave at that time. But anyway, she thought she was going to get her freedom. It's on the books. And she sued. It was in, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in the state of Virginia. And they changed the law at that point. Before that point, even if you had a quote, what they call bastard child, the man had to take care of it. The European man had to take care of it or anybody had to take care of it. But once they passed that law because they wanted, they didn't want the masters to keep freeing the slaves, they passed that law that the child follows the status of the mother. So if the mother is a slave, the child is a slave. And that opened the door to what, what we just read about all of these legitimate children. And as she said, it was quiet. It was a secret that was quietly kept. No one would come out and say whose children these were. And so that really changed the game. But there's more to that. But again, uh, Ima says, decent society, what a jaded perception that life by the white woman came. It, it, this, 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 uh, this experience as we're reading this is the beauty of it and this is exactly what the conversation as we begin to um uh look at it is that we're going to see the thought process and we're also going to see if we haven't seen if you see her early on she's sympathizing with the oppressor this is what they call stockholm syndrome or traumatic bonding 
Now she's the one who's doing having the ill done upon her, but she's sympathizing with the mistress. She feels sorry for her. But at the same, and this is the kind of way in which we operate today. But again, like I said, that's a whole nother thing, but it's definitely something as we go along, we could take note of. I see another um, another comment from Sister Malka that says, slaves had no, no right to family ties of their own, but yet an obligation to the care and nurturing of the family of their slave masters. I believe this has a devastating effect on us today. That's absolutely right. Today, you leave your three month old, your six week old child, and you take it to the nursery so that you can go into the quote unquote plantation and take care of master's business. That's the same thing you had to do in the days of slavery. You had to take your child off the breast and put somebody else's child. You had to put yourself, your needs, the needs of your family on the back burner. And we see that it was not something that was by mistake. It was by design that I'm going to break family ties so that your obligation would be to the oppressor. So those are great observations. This is a beautiful conversation. Um, if anybody has anything else to say, feel free to do so and share it because this is what we can see when we begin to you know, go around and say, what's wrong with our people? This is the roots um, of this dysfunctional behavior that we display today. These are definitely the roots. I see we got a little time. So I'm gonna I'm bust out chapter eight. Like I said, it's like a one pager and then we'll come back and reconvene um, so that we can get through this book. February is definitely a short month, so we don't wanna fall behind. It said, what slaves are taught to think of the North. Slaveholders pride themselves on being honorable men. But if you were to hear the enormous lies they tell their slaves, you would have small respect for their veracity. Hold on. It says, I have spoken plain English, pardon me. I cannot use a milder term. When they visit the North and return home, they tell the slaves of the runaways they have seen and describe them to be in the most deplorable condition propaganda. A slaveholder once told me that he had seen a runaway friend of mine in New York and that she besought him to take her back to her master for she was literally dying of starvation. That many days she had only one cold potato to eat and at other times could eat, get nothing at all. He said he refused to take her because he knew her master would not thank him for bringing such a miserable wretch to his house. He ended by saying to me, this is the punishment she brought on herself for running away from her kind master. This whole story was false. I afterwards stayed with that friend in New York and found her in comfortable circumstances. She had never thought of such a thing as wishing to go back to slavery. Many of the slaves believe such stories and think it is not worthwhile to exchange slavery for such a hard kind of freedom. It is difficult to persuade such that freedom could make them useful men and enable them to protect their wives and children. If those heathen in our Christian land had as much teaching as some Hindus, they would think otherwise. They would know that liberty is more valuable than life. They will begin to understand their own capabilities and exert themselves to become men and women. But while the free states sustain a law which hurls fugitives back into slavery, how can the slaves resolve to become men? And at this time in history, she's talking about the fugitive slave laws when a lot of slaves started running away, and these are all in the books as well. They bust out the fugitive slave laws that are required now non-slaveholding states to send back slaves. And we know according to Torah, if a slave run away, you're not even supposed to send them back. But um, let's continue. There are some who strive to protect wives and daughters from the insults of their masters. But those who have such sentiments have had advantage above the general mass of slaves. They have been particularly civilized and Christianized by favorable circumstances. Some are bold enough to utter such sentiments to their master, oh, that they were more of them. Some poor creatures have been so brutalized by the lash that they will sneak out of the way to give their masters free access to their wives and daughters. Let me read that again. That's the throwing under the bus. Let's read that again. Some poor creatures have been so brutalized by the lash, she's talking about the, the masculine principle, the men, that they will sneak out of the way to give their masters free access to their wives and daughters. Do you think this proves the black man to be long to an inferior order of beings? What would you be? if you had been born and brought up a slave with generations of slaves for ancestors. 
I admit that the black man is inferior. This is her words. But what is it that makes him so? It is the ignorance in which white men compel him to live. It is the torturing whip that lashes manhood out of him. It is the fierce bloodhounds of the South and the scarcely less cruel human bloodhounds of the North who enforce the fugitive slave law. They do the work. Southern gentlemen indulge in the most contemptuous expression about the Yankees, while they on their part consent to do the vilest work for them, such as the ferocious bloodhounds and the despised Negro hunters who are employed to do at home. When Southerners go to the North, they are proud to do them honor. But the Northern man is not welcome south of Mason-Dixon line unless he suppresses every thought and feeling at variance with the quote unquote particular institution, AKA slavery. Like you come down south, you better shut your mouth. But right now the south got the power, they got the money. So, you know, you don't come down here with all that slave should be free stuff. Nor is it enough to be silent. The masters are not pleased unless they obtain a greater degree of subservience than that. And they are generally accommodated. Do they respect the northerner for this? I trow not. Even the slaves despise a northern man with quote, southern principles. And that is the class they generally see. When northerners go to the south to reside, they prove very apt scholars. They soon imbibe the sentiments and disposition of their neighbors and generally go beyond their teachers. Of the two, they are proverbially the hardest masters. They seem to satisfy their conscience with the doctrine that, quote, God created the Africans to be slaves. What a liable upon the heavenly father who made one blood of all nations of men. And then who are Africans? She asks, who can measure the amount of anger slaps and blood coursing in the veins of American slaves? I have spoken of pains, slaveholders taken to give their slaves a bad opinion of the North. But notwithstanding this, intelligent slaves are aware that they have many friends in free states. Even the most ignorant have some confused notions about it. They know I could read, and I was often asked if I had seen anything in the newspapers about white folks over in the big north who were trying to get their freedom from them. Some believe that the abolitionists have already made them free and that it is established by law, but their masters present the, prevent the law from going into effect. One woman begged me to get a newspaper and read it over. She said her husband told her that the black people had sent word to the queen of Marika, or I guess America, that they were all slaves, that she didn't believe it and went to Washington city to see the president about it. They quarreled. She drew her sword upon him and swore that he should help her to make them all free. The poor ignorant woman thought that America was governed by a queen to whom the president was subordinate. I wish the president was supporting it to Queen Justice, she says. And that's the end of the reading of chapter eight. Um, thank you those who have just joined us. This was Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. What is this, chapter part four? We read through three chapters. I gotta mark that down. If you have anything to say at this time, feel free to do so. Very, very interesting chapter. She's going from one topic to a next, some longer than others, you know, and she's just really going into her experience in as a house slave, as she said, a favored slave who people often think that everybody was, uh, you know, she was abused, but he was trying to do it in a way. And like she said, because of the town that she lived in and the, uh, the accountability around him, he couldn't do it forcibly. So he was trying to get her to concede. And this was uh, Dr. Flint's, the uh, roguish Dr. Flint, this was his method of coercion. Um, and we can see the way he's playing these mind games. You know, I wasn't I nice to you? Haven't I been good to you? Okay, dude, she's a slave and you know, you're subjugating her to your will. So we can see how it plays over today and in, in how we move around. Um, like I said, it's just very, very interesting. For those who've just joined us, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up now and come back again. Let me check and see if we have any updates on social media. And most I will, we'll be back tomorrow and read what's that chapter 9 10 and we'll see if we have uh, any more time for any more chapters so until next time i pray everybody have a blessed evening and definitely continue to read and get in and these narratives there's so many of them um just as we're doing to be able to broaden our historical base and get accurate understanding of those who came before us and also be able to 
look at what's happening now with a clearer lens. So until next time, my name is Amuna Yisrael. This is The Left Project. Everybody have a blessed night.